Based on my YouTube analytics and my third most popular video, you have heard of a show called Has Been Hotel, or Hell of a Boss if you have taste. The pilot of the show sits at a modest 11 million views, which means it did pretty alright. Eh, it could have done a little better, but it is maybe one of the most important events in the history of indie animation on YouTube. No, I'm not kidding. Has Been Hotel quite literally destroyed the perceived ceiling set on indie animation since the very beginning. Before, any indie animation project would never really be able to measure up to something released on network television. It would never be as popular and wouldn't generate the level of money a professional and successful animated project would. From revenue generated from airing it on a network and merch sales, Hasbun Hotel's pilot had 46 million views in its first year, which generated a fuck ton of money. It generated mountains of fan works and also produced a decent bit of merch. For more proof of its success, Hasbin was picked up by an actual company, also a pretty small one. I get why you wouldn't have heard of it, the really small company is called fucking Amazon. Hasbin Hotel became proof that an indie animation could become a serialized TV show if the creators were willing to put in the time and work necessary. But things always weren't this way. For a time, indie animation on YouTube wasn't, but before that, it was. Sorry, I think I just lost a brain cell. The history of indie animation is filled with incredible highs, very, very embarrassing lows, and... Uh, so, let's start from the beginning. If you were even semi-conscious in the mid-2000s, you would have heard of a wonderful site called Newgrounds. I'd say based on my analytics you do, but... <laughs> We both know that isn't true. So I know for a fact that a lot of you don't know how amazing this site was back in the day. There wasn't really a lot of places for mass sharing of animations in the early 2000s. So once Newgrounds... Oh, green screen. So once Newgrounds stepped in, it became a lot of people's go-to site to share these things. There was some straight heat posted to this site. My personal favorite thing ever was Sonic Nozzle Unleashed, rest in peace. But this era of perfection couldn't last forever. While Newgrounds audience was pretty big, YouTube completely dwarfed it in size. Newgrounds creators started posting to both sides or just outright abandoned Newgrounds to focus on their new YouTube audience. Audience. While this might have felt like the destruction of heaven at the time, this also created the best era of YouTube. Man, I'm getting nostalgic just thinking about how simple things were back then. I'd get back from a long day of school and watch a bunch of these fat hours. Man, where'd the time go? Actual series started popping up too, like Ed's World. I, uh... I didn't like this one too much. This was one of the first indie projects that I can think of that actually had a full team working on it. Despite me not really vibing with it, making it the objectively correct opinion, I understand that some of the jokes are solid and people did really like it. The creator actually died over a decade ago. Thankfully, the partner was able to take over development of Ed's world in that time. Ed left the building blocks necessary for so many people to follow and I don't want to ignore that. The MLP vs Sonic series, the SMG4 series, and fucking FNF. Yeah, FNF has its roots in Newgrounds, which is pretty cool. But since this is still Newgrounds, once FNF hit YouTube, it blew up even more and people forgot that it even came from Newgrounds. The point I'm trying to make here is that indie animations were gaining massive popularity in the mid 2000s. This then caused creators to start improving in real time. So we got some genuinely good animation, even for today's standards. And then it died. Do you like cooking? <gasps> Don't worry, neither do I. I don't know, just like for some reason I just can't handle it. So I popped off once Factor reached out. For those out of the loop, Factor makes meeting your nutrition goals easy by delivering fresh and delicious foods, only made with the best ingredients right to your doorstep. 
Factor takes the stress out of meal preps by giving you over 35 different meals to choose from every week. So no more grocery trips, prep work, or cooking burnout. You can get ready-made meals in two minutes with Factor's collection of ready-to-eat meals, meaning you're spending less time in the kitchen and more time living your short and fleeing life. Factor are currently allowing anyone who uses my code a 50% discount on their first Factor box, plus 20% off your next Next month as well. Considering how much time this is saving, I think it's worth it. So head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code DBO50 to get 50% off your first factor box and 20% off the next month's orders. That's code DBO50 at factor75.com to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month of orders. Now back to the video. So right as indie animation was starting to hit its stride on YouTube, it's almost seemed to hit a major brick wall out of nowhere. Channels that dominated YouTube just stopped showing up all of a sudden. What was happening? There were two main causes of this, both stemming from how the algorithm and watch time worked. First nail was the YouTube algorithm changing to push out content coming from channels that posted quickly. Animation surprisingly takes quite a while, so a lot of creators were posting a video once a month if they were lucky, which caused a lot of them at the time to basically have no presence on the recommended tab. That's already bad, but the final nail in animation YouTube was a change to how revenue worked. Before, revenue was entirely based on views. YouTube changed this so the main dictator of a person's revenue that month was mid-roll ads, which as a byproduct made watch time very important as the longer a person watches a video, the more chance they have to see an ad. Why was this bad for animators? Well, 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 animation takes a lot of of time, so a lot of creators could only afford to post like a three minute video once a month. Don't get me wrong, it was impressive animation, but that would never please the deific and unknown YouTube algorithm that destroys creators' psyches in their attempts at virality. I might need a therapist. A new genre started picking up steam during this time too. And it's technically indie animation, so I think it's worth bringing up. Storytime YouTube wasn't something I cared for as a kid. <laughs> you put a cartoon sprite on the screen though, and I'm eating that shit up. I can't say indie animation outright died during this period, however. During the first half of the 2010s, we had a series called Ruby that began releasing on YouTube. This was the second 3D animated project that really took off, and and that made sense. Even to the lowest of life forms, they'd say the same thing. Oh wow, this is really cool. Wait, furry racism? Ruby follows the four main characters making up the acronym of the show. It's got everything. A magical school for the characters to hone their powers, the avatar state, and who could forget? Racism. Look, it's 2024. You are not here to see me rag on fucking Ruby of all things. The music is really good sometimes. <laughs> This was also the first time an animated project was given proper company backing from my knowledge. Rooster Teeth might not have the infinite amount of money something like Amazon has, yet it was still a company with a bit of money. They handled other really impactful series before Ruby, Red vs Blue, a series that no one in my audience has watched. God, why people so young? This was a major turning point in the history of indie animation. This was the first ever company to start funding animated indie projects, and they were 3D ones as well. I wonder if this will become relevant later. While the genre was stepping into new territories elsewhere, it was straight up getting cooked in some other places. Something that kind of breaks the timeline is Rooster Teeth being bought by Warner Bros. To a lot of people, they might see this as a good thing. Each and every one of you were 100% WRONG! By being picked up by such a massive company, indie animation should have exploded at this time. What actually ended up happening was Warner Bros making misfire after misfire handling rooster teeth, laying off employees, creating unsuccessful business ventures, and eventually just shutting down rooster teeth, which is somehow better than what they were doing with other projects. 
Something that has become a wider issue are companies like Warner Bros just destroying creative people's hard work for the sake of their bottom line. I know this is an animation, but an entire film was wiped off the face of the planet despite being nearly done. The creators only finding out mid-holiday that they both lost their jobs and lost access to all of the months and for some people years of work they've put into this movie. Back to some animations, promising cartoons like Infinity Train and Inside Job were nuked by their respective platforms for no reason, despite me seeing nothing but praise for them. Then there's something like Nickelodeon's slot machine approach to making cartoons, milling out so many animated projects and all watching them fail to reach the heights of their biggest hits. All of these approaches show a blatant lack of care for the creator. I mean, why should big companies care about anyone, right? If a creator gets a little too loud, just have him shot out back and replace them with someone more agreeable. I'm sure this won't lead to dire consequences like, I don't know, a movie you spent $200 million on being a huge piece of shit. Uh, but what do I know? I'm just another spoke on the wheel. In the 2010s and clearly the 2020s, the mistreatment of creators by the companies they work for has never been so frequently publicized. Regardless of this fact, it was still one of the only ways a person could have their idea published to a grander stage. Or so they'd like you to think. Just before the shift of the decade, something else would permanently alter the direction of indie animation forever. Husband Hotel. <laughs> but before that, look at these numbers. Aren't they just pathetic? Hi, Border Orange is here. Multi-millionaire, boy failure, and epic influencer. Uh, sorry, I almost threw up. I want to hit a nondescript YouTube goal so my parents will actually pick up my phone calls and you can help. If you're enjoying what you're seeing so far or have watched my other videos, then hit subscribe. I also have a Discord server. There's also a Twitter and an Instagram for posting about my mundane life, a Twitch that I try to stream on at least once a month, and a throne in Patreon because I want all of your money. Um... For legal reasons, I have to clarify that was a joke. So if any of these perks seem enticing, then check them out. Anyway, back to the video. I am not the biggest fan of Has Been Hotel. It's not really a surprise since I take every opportunity I can to dog on it. But even I can't deny that it is one of the biggest events for indie animation on YouTube. It also serves as a great example of hard work genuinely paying off. Vivian Mendrano or Vivzy Pop if you're normal didn't just start with Has Been Hotel. She actually worked on a lot of other stuff in order to fund Has Been. She has been working in the animation industry as early as 2011, working on other people's animations like Blenderstein. This will be important later so pay attention. By creating these connections, gaining more field experience and receiving criticism of her own projects all at the same time, Vivzi was almost overqualified for the typical indie animation project on YouTube, which I believe helped create the success of Has Been Hotel. In 2024, the Has Been Hotel pilot sits at a modest 11 million views, which meant only a few people had seen it. This came out during the pandemic too, so a lot of people were trapped inside and using the internet a lot more, which I think helped just a tiny bit with the show's reception. Oh, right, the show's reception. <laughs> People immediately fell in love with Hasbun Hotel's world and characters. A quick plot synopsis for the four people who haven't seen Hasbun. Our protagonist Charlie attempts to rehabilitate some of Hell's sinners to prove that the broken afterlife system is well broken. The show is also filled with cuss words and is a musical. Not exactly my cup of tea, and there are a few glaring issues I have with the pilot, but I admit this is a cool concept. From just the pilot alone, Hasbun Hotel garnered a massive fan base eagerly waiting for the next episode to release. Oh right, there were no more episodes until 2024. Pop had much larger plans for this series than just keeping it on YouTube. Her plan from the very start was to have Hasbin get picked up by a real studio, like Fox or something. The way she got this done was by showing these execs how well her pilot had done on YouTube. The fan works, covers, 
those bountiful viewers that the networks would be throffing at the mouth to obtain. Passion can get you pretty far on a place like YouTube, but you need that little extra edge for a big time studio to give you the time of day. And Vivzi did have that. Her show's pilot pulled in a boatload of money from both views and merch. I haven't even spoken about how much of a draw merch is for these type of things yet, but oh buddy, I will. <laughs> Another thing that needs to be considered is the promotion behind a show. You could have a banger idea, but if there are no viewers, then you're cooked. Hell, even if you have viewers, you might just get fucked. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not bad. Thankfully, promotion was already handled. So to a lot of corporations, Hasbun Hotel seemed like a given success. However, we wouldn't find out until a few years down the line. So in the meantime, I'd like to briefly talk about Hell of a Boss. It's, in my opinion, a really solid piece of media with a few issues here and there. Or that's at least what Twitter tells me. Hell of a Boss is currently staying on YouTube, and I think that's for the best. When you're the only person in charge of a project, it's a lot easier to manage release dates, and what is and isn't allowed in the show, which is something I think indie animations will always have over something released by a studio. I think you can see a lot of improvement from the has-been pilot when you compare it to the later episodes of Hell of a. Characters are a lot more on model. The writing is a lot better and the music doesn't make me want to tear my fucking ears off. Like, is that just a me thing? I really like the presentation of Helva, but then I tried to watch Hasbun and I feel like they couldn't have been produced by the same person. Speaking of Hasbun Hotel, its official release was incredible. It was the number one most watched show on Amazon Prime, which is nothing to scoff at, since it was competing with Gen V and then Invincible, two very good and very popular shows. Who who knew if you just did all of the hard parts yourself, then networks would suddenly jump at the opportunity to work with you. I would like to call Vivzi's 10 year grind the new industry standard for an animation team trying to make an animated show, but I don't know enough about the process of getting a show picked up, so I won't pretend that I do. What I do know though is that the success of Has Been and Halava to a smaller extent did inspire people to give it a shot. Long Gone Gulch released about two years years after Hasbun Hotel. I can tell you exactly what I was doing at the time because I actually made a video on it back in the day. I'm not gonna pretend that I've been an OG Long Gone Gulch fan, but I can say that YouTube did something right. I will not be commenting on the quality at this date and time. What was interesting is that the creator of Blenderstein also was a major part of the development with this show. I told you who was going to be important later, you better have been paying attention. Long Gone Gulch currently sits at 3.6 million in views and its other episodes Okay, that felt a bit mean, but I'm not sure we ever got an announcement about more episodes because of the pandemic ruining everything. Check out Lobside Animation though. They'd still make stuff and they're actually selling a Long Gone Gulch art book at the moment, so check that out. I could go on about the amount of indie animation projects that were announced during this time, but I'd be here all day, so here's a link in the description to some of my favorites. While this is all well and good, something that became notable to me was that you had to know the right people to actually have a shot to make your series popular. I was very wrong, but let's pretend I was for the sake of building some suspense. Releasing about the same time as Has Been Hotel, Spooky Month's gimmick was that an episode would release only during October, which the creators have stuck to consistently. I'm kidding. Animation takes a long time, so Sir Pello is forgiven. This time. You remember Sir Pello, right? Uh, look, here's a flashback to Underpants. Anyway, Sir Pello is just a naturally funny person as seen by his meltdown during the production of the most recent Spooky Month episode. Listen here! If you, if you don't let me in, I'm gonna make another phone, that's right. I keep getting this. I gotta reload. I gotta reload again. Oh, too bad, because, because heavy traffic. You let me in. Last chance. I, I, I am way fucking late. It's already 10 over here. And I can have to... You let me in, or I'm gonna make another phone. Please. 
Please, pretty, pretty, please. Honestly, the animators missing the deadline isn't even too bad since the whole point of this series is that every day is Halloween if you don't think about it too hard. Spooky Month is just one of those shows that makes me want to be a clip dub channel because it's hilarious. It actually makes this job super easy. Get out of this body. The power of the Lord compels you. 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 The reason I wanted to briefly talk about Spooky Month is because it has its origins in Newgrounds. Yeah, you know, the quote unquote dead platform. Turns out people just kept posting to it while my focus moved over to animation on YouTube. Newgrounds is popping harder than it ever has and I really love that. It has truly become a place to share indie animations and FNF because I exclusively decide what is allowed to be an indie animation. It is crazy that two gigantic indie projects dropped out around the same time and five years later are somehow even more popular. The only thing I can call this is the resurgence of indie animation, but not actually, right? I mean, basically all of the examples I have used had a team of people working with them as opposed to the old ways. One person painstakingly animating for months on end to produce one video. Not every creator was going to have the luxury of a studio like Vivzi or a team like Serpello. And due to Hasman's success making a cartoon with a lot of cussing suddenly not cool anymore, as if you weren't fucking cackling at that shit for the last 30 years, most projects still lacks the necessary funding for the the whole being your own boss thing to really work and someone noticed an industry veteran who'd already succeeded with his own indie project enter glitch productions remember luke ludwood charcoal uh there was supposed to be a flashback but i ran out of budget well in 2018 he with the help of his brother kevin rebranded the channel as glitch productions a channel who uh, come on, I don't need to explain this to you, you already know what they do. Glitch Productions was the answer to the issue I brought up earlier. What if I want to make a cool thing and I don't have the money? Glitch <laughs> Production almost acted like the tiny build of indie animation. People would come up with an idea for a show and Glitch Productions would fund the pilot and any future episodes. If there were future episodes. And it's been doing them wonders. By using Luke's... I... God, his last name's so hard to pronounce. Using the pre-existing connections the brothers already had, they managed to generate enough hype to get the Meta Runner Season 1 movie to 1 million views. And this was arguably one of their last less popular series. I need to clarify that I don't think Meta Runner wasn't popular. The announcement for season 2 has more views than any single video on my channel. It just happens that literally anything Glitch Productions posted after this point was more popular. This kind of makes sense though. The budget and skill of these animations would only improve with the previous ones being popular, which then greatly improves the chances of the next series being popular and vice versa. Glitch Productions at the time of writing the script have only produced like five animated shows. All of them were incredibly popular in their own right. They had all of the fan works you could think of. Fan art, fan covers, analysis videos. They were hitting the grind and building up a really good reputation on the internet. The only thing I think they were missing at the time was a show to break the internet like Hasbun Hotel did. Something to make Glitch Productions a household name. You can say fuck in this one. Welcome to the wonderful world of the Amazing Digital Circus. Also known as the totally not a the Amazing Digital Circus review section of the video. To be fair, <laughs> how could I not? It's wacky and so fun and colorful. They sing songs, they go on fun adventures, and they always deal with the crippling feeling of loneliness. Beneath the cutesy demeanor of the characters, the Amazing Digital Circus is the... It's the Evangelion of the indie animation scene. Following the success of Hasbin, the creator of Digital Circus, Gooseworks, oh, I can't, I fucking hate these names, knew they needed to hook us immediately, and I think they did a pretty good job. The show starts off as a pretty happy one, but peep the OST in the background. It 
it's a difficult sound to balance, to sound both happy and upbeat, but still able to make you uneasy when you're paying attention. The star of the show is Pomni, the newest of the digital circus. There are other characters, none as important as Jax, but they fill the space on screen sometimes, so there's that I guess. All of the characters seem to be on the verge of breaking in many different ways. There's Zuby's straight up disinterest in well, everything really. King is tweaking nearly every time he's on screen, or Ragatha's toxic positivity that Jax frequently takes advantage of. The pilot episode is constantly building towards the very moment Pomni finally cracks and truly accepts her situation in the circus. But she isn't able to necessarily wallow in it, because if she does, she becomes a glitchy amalgam. So she's left in this kind of middle ground where she needs to accept the reality that she's in, but she can't express the necessary feelings to the situation or she'll lose herself. And once she came to that realization, There was a reason this scene specifically was memed as heavily as it was by the internet. And it's because it's already iconic. The music, the expression, it's all, and I hate using this word, but perfect. Everything down to the last minute details. By tackling the existential dread of being in a situation like the Digital Circus, the show is able to differentiate itself from its competition. Despite how silly the show looks at times, its themes are taken seriously and the characters handle it in a very realistic way. Like Pomni's fear in episode 2, that real fear of going insane or being forgotten and never escaping the digital world. Or the crocodile's realization that everything he has ever cared about doesn't matter. Sorry, I got distracted. Uh, if you're wondering why I never bothered to call him by his name, this is why. Welcome back, my little hard-shelled hamburgers! So this is the circus, huh? I gotta get used to this. Oh, looks like one of these guys made it through! Wait, what? <laughs> The mystery of how the world they live in even works, like who is trapping people there, and just what the hell is Cain, the host of the world who seems to have off powers for whatever reason. The reason I think the show did so well is because it makes an effort to actually make people give a fuck. The show only has two episodes out, and it's a bit hard to really say anything definitely, but I can say the writing is really solid. I actually audibly laughed at a few jokes, which is because outside of my videos, I'm about as expressive as a single cube of sugar. Ladies first. No, wait, why would I say that? The marketing is also incredible. The soundtrack for the first episode is elite. It doesn't touch Undertales, but I should be using it more since the memes with it have started to quiet down a bit. I also don't think I've ever seen a merch drop acknowledge knockoff merch before and do it in such a funny way as well. These products are only available at digitalcircus.store. Any other source is a dirty bootleg and won't support the show. No matter how <laughs> they look, that's digitalcircus.store. I actually own the Pomni plushie, which might be the most impactful thing I've done to the world. I don't buy YouTube merch that often, but I almost instantly cop this because like, come on, how would I not? Oh, also, I only do normal things of it since I'm not a degenerate. The Amazing Digital Circus is by far the biggest indie cartoon on YouTube right now. The pilot has 300 million views at the time of recording. I know it's good, but fuck me, dude. When the second episode dropped, I had people complaining about Jax's characterization. Like, bruh, it's the first episode. You got people making whole ass fanfics on these guys when we barely know anything about them. That is the stamp of a popular show right there. But we have to remember that none of this would have been possible if Newgrounds and Has Been didn't pop off the way it did. Huh. For once I managed to say something positive about has been and Vivzy Pop without a gun being pointed to my head. I'm not too sure if this is character development or if I've just gone soft. So what was the point of any of this? You know, other than throwing subtle shots at has been hotel, I did kind of make this video for a greater purpose. Th no, that just doesn't feel right. I brought it up earlier, but the fact that these companies have enough power to just erase someone's hard work from existence 
isn't right. It was quite disheartening to watch something like Infinity Train get old yellowed as if there weren't creative people working on the show. With passionate fans waiting for the series to be concluded, indie animation kind of allows people to make the things that wouldn't be picked up or treated correctly by big networks and lets it grow. I guarantee if something like Spooky Month was ever a thing on CN for example, Aquafina would be a recurring character and also the series would be unfunny and cancelled off the two seasons. Even in my more positive videos, there's this lingering hater energy that I give off. This video was my attempt to show some appreciation to a genre that is immune to a lot of the other corporate bullshit that plagues the other things I like. Thing is, the platforms for these bold new takes on animation have existed for a long time. Newgrounds is older than me by a whole decade. Since the day I was born, I have always and will continue to be eating good. Something I found out about recently was Adult Swim. It's not available in the UK, so I've gone out of my way to pirate- obtain legal viewings of the, the, the shows I like. Like, Smiling Friends is genuinely one of the best cartoons I've ever watched, and it's only on its second season. I'm glad I was able to experience this resurgence of indie animation in its many forms throughout the years, and I hope this video has helped in making that clear. Thanks for watching. Okay, now that I've shown this plush for more than 10 seconds, I can officially claim it as a tax write-off. Get fucked, IRS! I hope everyone has a wonderful day. See you, lads. <laughs>